Welcome to today's talk, Thursday the 18th of January. Now, being a fairly sad individual, I was browsing through the Cambridge Dictionary and I found a rather interesting uh, idiom. That's the link there. Now, the idiom is accidentally on purpose. <laughs> and it means this. If you do something accidentally on purpose, you do it intentionally, but pretend it happened by chance. I never liked those glasses of Peter's. I might drop them one day. Accidentally on purpose. Now, today we're going to be looking at a peer-reviewed journal about lab leaks, peer-reviewed, evidenced leaks from laboratories uh, for viruses, bacterium, fungi, parasites and prions, these proteinaceous infectious particles that are somewhat of a concern as well. But the point is, these agents could be released deliberately by malicious actors. And surprisingly enough, there is one, two, maybe even three or four malicious actors in the world or even organisations that might deliberately release such an organism. The potential for biological warfare is real. Uh, now, this is the paper I'm going to be looking at here, fully peer-reviewed paper from The Lancet. The Lancet does still come up with some, uh, some fairly good papers from time to time. And also in today's video, I'll be looking at uh, the World Economic Forum preparing for disease X. Now, of course, it's very good of these, ele uh, these elite people to uh, prepare for threats to us, uh, proletariat, to, 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 uh, to the plebeian class, uh, you know, who might need their gracious help at some point in the future. So we'll be looking at that in a minute. And then you can let me know whether you're reassured or not. I actually can't remember voting for any of the delegates, but, uh, but anyway, that's a separate matter. Um, now, let's get on with this particular paper from the Lancet, first of all. Laboratory Acquired Infection and Pathogen Escape Worldwide Between 2000 and uh, 2021. Now, they do go back further in their literature. I'm not going to cover it now because the video would be too long, but they go right back to the 1940s identifying lab leaks that are in the literature uh, from that time. And of course, there may have been leaks before that that we don't know about that aren't in the literature, quite possible. But let's get straight down to what this is saying. Peer-reviewed, uh, good quality scientists, the Lancet Microbe. They say this, laboratory acquired infections, LAIs, <laughs> uh, and accidental pathogen escape from laboratory settings, APELs. <laughs> um, what about them? Uh, are a major concern for the community. So major concern for the community, and I guess that means the community of worldwide humans. A risk-based approach for pathogen research management within a standard biosafety management framework is recommended, but is challenging. Well, I think we all know from potentially from recent experience that yes, it is challenging to establish biosecurity. Uh, it is challenging. <laughs> nice understatement. D due to uh, reasons such as uh, inconsistency uh, in risk uh, tolerance and perception. Some people just don't see the risk. Other people are prepared to tolerate the risk. Here we perform a scoping review, looking at everything they could find, basically, using public available peer-reviewed uh, journal and media reports of uh, laboratory associated incidents uh, and uh, what was APELS again accidental pathogen escape from laboratory settings <laughs> between 2020 and 2021. Now of course um, they did have fairly uh, stringent exclusion criteria so they only took things that there was good evidence for and of course these are just things all they could take was what is in the public domain things that basically had been published I wonder if there's things that aren't in the public domain. I guess that's uh, um, known unknowns. We, we know they're there, but we don't know what they are, I guess. Um, so only focused on what is sort of in the public domain. Declarations of interest in the authors. Always check this for papers now, just in case someone's got a competing interest. But they declared no competing interest. Therefore, we may carry on. Right. Laboratory acquired infections. 309 individuals, 94 reports, 51 different pathogens, disease-causing microorganisms. Eight fatalities reported, and again, I'm stressing that this is in the peer-reviewed literature. Now, um, you might think it's uh, 8 million or more. 
um, this is what's in the peer-reviewed literature, this is what's in that paper, uh, whatever you want to think is up to you, of course. Um, 2.6 of these were uh, fatal. 2.6. Now, now, this one here, this causes uh, bacterial meningitis. So that's quite a nasty one. Yersinia pestis. Um, have you heard of Yersinia pestis before? Well, um, this was what caused the Black Death, the major outbreak. So in in uh, 1349, 1350, this killed probably half the population of my country and all the Eurasian landmass. Now, it didn't get to the Antipodes. It didn't get to the Americas. But apart from that, it killed pretty well half of the entire world's population. Estimates vary between 40 and 60 percent. This is quite incredible. Just imagine that 50 percent of the human race were to, to die. Uh, the, the impact is just uh, incredible. Yersinia pestis. Um, People still experimenting with it. Not particularly dangerous now, really, in a, in, a, in a sense, because we can treat it with antibiotics. The reason we no longer, because we get outbreaks of Yersinia pestis and the respiratory form as well, quite commonly. But because we treat it with antibiotics, we treat it at cause. And because we treat the cause in individuals, they're no longer infectious, which, of course, is uh, what we want because of the, the cure. That's, so it's, it's an example of stopping a pandemic and it would become a pandemic if we didn't treat it, uh, a pandemic with curative treatment as opposed to, oh, I don't know, say prophylactic vaccination, an alternative approach. Quite quite a good idea, really. Um, this this one causes uh, enteric fever, Ebola virus, of course, terrible virus, about 50% mortality. So let's be quite clear. Laboratory work, experimental work, has been carried out in laboratories around the world on a virus, the Ebola virus, that kills 50% of people that it infects. And unlike Yersinia pestis, where we can treat it with antibiotics, Ebola, we cannot treat it with um, antibiotics, of course, because it's a, it's a virus. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy. This is the prion disease that affected cattle, and it also affects humans in the form of what we call creutzfeldt jakob disease so that's known to have killed people now um accidental pathogen escape from laboratory settings 16 were reported now this one here uh, anthrax now anthrax is a really nasty bacterial disease and it can affect uh, a bit like bse and foot and mouth disease it can affect uh, animals cattle particularly as well as humans now now there does seem to be a bit of a I haven't studied this in detail, but there does seem to be a bit of a global, uh, what's his word, uh, war too strong a word, but uh, certainly a downer on, on, on cattle at the moment. Um, in uh, farmers in Netherlands, farmers in Germany, farmers in Ireland. Um, you know, I really hope there isn't an accidental release of a disease that affects the world's uh, cattle. That would be that would be very very bad indeed. Uh, people have been experimenting on SARS coronavirus 2 and that has been subject to accidental pathogen escape from laboratory settings. They do not say which uh, SARS coronavirus. So did I say 2 then? I, I didn't mean, genuinely didn't mean to say that. They don't say that in the paper. Now, we may think that SARS coronavirus 2 escaped from a laboratory, as I suspect, strongly suspect, but that's not what they say in the paper. Polio virus, of course, causes a terrible paralyzing illness. Uh, brucella, so brucellosis, zoonosis, mostly caught from animals, limited human to human transmission, can cause intermittent fevers, and um, this can affect the uh, genitourinary tract uh, as well. People have also been experimenting with foot and mouth disease virus, uh, particularly the one that affects uh, cattle. We've had a terrible outbreak of that before, where millions of cows, I don't know how many millions of cows, were mostly unnecessarily uh, slaughtered. Um, where, where I live in Cumbria, there's a lot of agricultural areas round about, and, and for weeks we could smell the acrid smell in the air of burning cattle because of uh, misplaced, largely because of misplaced modelling. Um, another mistake of disease modelling, but we're not going to go into that now. And of course, people have been experimenting on uh, H5N1. This is the uh, bird flu virus. Um, now, there is a real risk of this escaping into human beings, especially if there's a genetic uh, shift that could occur if it combines with another virus. And um, the, 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 the potential there is, is there for a human pandemic, and yet people see fit to experiment with this. 
They also gave a couple of interesting examples. The discovery of historical variola, smallpox, ampules in a cold storage during a move at laboratories in the National Institutes of Health Campus Bethesda. It had just been forgotten about. So smallpox had been forgotten about in a cupboard, albeit a cold storage cupboard. Uh, the shipment of live anthrax cultures from a US Department Defence Laboratory following incomplete activation. So live anthrax being shipped around the place. Um, so there we go. Peer-reviewed evidence of definitive uh, lab leaks. Um, not uh, not good. Accidental lab leaks will carry on. Um, deliberate lab leaks, uh, biological warfare are, are possibilities. Are possibilities. We hope they never happen. Now, we did uh, look at this paper recently um, uh, of just an example of viral experimentation. Lethal infection of human ACE2 transgenic mice caused by SARS coronavirus 2 related pangolin coronaviruses. So, this is uh, lethal kills infection of uh, humanized mice. So, these are mice with a human gene. Uh, they're called transgenic organisms. So they've been given the gene to make uh, the ACE receptor site, the human gene. They're still mice, but they, they express this human um, ACE receptor site. Now, you might think that crossing mice and humans or inserting human genes in mice is of questionable ethics. It, it could be. But the point is the mice can be treated as laboratory experimental substitutes for humans because they are expressing human proteins. And they were experimenting with this SARS coronavirus 2 related pangolin coronavirus. This research happened to have been done in China. I must say, I'm some, somewhat surprised this made it to, it's a preprint, but I'm somewhat surprised it made it to publication. I suspect it might be withdrawn somewhere when, 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 so, withdrawn to when someone realises uh, that they kind of uh, forgot what they weren't supposed to know. But we'll see, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 related pangolin coronavirus. This is it here, it's called GX. Uh, can cause 100% mortality in human ACE2 uh, transgenic mice. So we have a virus here affecting human proteins in mice, but it kills 100% of the mice infected. I think I'd rather not know what would happen if that virus got into human beings. Because I strongly suspect that 100% of them would no longer be alive shortly after, especially if they weren't allowed uh, curative treatments or helping treatments. Um, potentially attributable to late stage brain infection. So the, the, the mode of death here was brain infection. It did affect other organs, but they died of brain uh, infection. So this particular SARS coronavirus caused the brain infection. This underscores the spillover risk of uh, GX into humans. Well, actually, it doesn't. Uh, I don't agree with that because this virus was not taken from a natural population, which would cause spillover. This virus was generated in the laboratory by a process called cell culture adapted mutation. In other words, they put it, presumably, they don't give the details, but cell culture adapted mutation. It is a mutant um, and it's been uh, infected various cell cultures. Then all of a sudden they find out there's this variant of the virus through this cell culture adapted uh, mutation process. And they thought, oh, hey, this is 100% lethal. Interesting. Let's do some more work on it. Or did they see potential other uses of it? Oh, there's a virus here that's 100% lethal. I wonder if that could be useful for anything. I mean, I can't think of anything it could be useful for. Why on earth would you want a virus that killed 100% of people that infected? I can't think of any possible reason why you would want that. But anyway, moving on. Now, um, this is from Revelation chapter 6. Uh, then another horse came out, a fiery red one. It's the second horseman of the apocalypse. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth, to make people kill each other. Make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Now, I assume this large sword, I've always assumed that this large sword, carried by the second horseman of the apocalypse, was nuclear weapons. So people were 
nuclear weapons were available. That's a very large sword. It's got great killing capacity. And uh, people kill each other with them. That's has tragically happened already. Um, but um, maybe, maybe that large sword is a, a virus with massive killing capacity. Let's watch a couple of video clips and then, uh, and then we'll wrap this video up. Indeed. But you would therefore accept that it, it turned out your trust in the system of government, your trust in, as you've described it, in, in the understanding mm. that structurally the United Kingdom was well placed to meet the challenges mm. of this new virus, were misplaced. It turned out we were not. We were not as well prepared as we uh, should have been, ideally. I think that is true. Um, uh, again, uh, it's in the nature of the fact that um, the virus was novel. Um, and, and indeed, I think, so. this probably goes beyond the remit of the inquiry, um, there is a significant body of, uh, uh, of judgment uh, that believes that the, the virus itself was man-made. Um, and that, that presents... Well, we're a set of challenges as well. Forms no part of the terms of reference Indeed. of this inquiry, Mr. Gove, to address that somewhat divisive issue. So we're not going to go there. This is Mr. Gove, senior British politician, a significant body of judgment that believes the virus itself, the SARS coronavirus 2, was man made. And that presents a set of challenges. Well, yeah, I think it does set, uh, uh, bring a set of challenges because if it's happened once, it could happen again and we need to learn from the mistakes of history. Now, if I'd been the uh, King's Councillor there, I think I might have taken slightly more interest in saying, we're not going to go there. Absolutely closed it down. We're not going to go there. I would have thought, I mean, if it had been me, I mean, I'm not a King's Councillor, but I would have said, Really? That's interesting. You've got some evidence for that. What is that evidence? Let's examine that. Let's work out how this catastrophe happened. Let's work out how this catastrophic result to this catastrophe happened. And let's make sure a bigger catastrophe doesn't happen in the future. But no, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. Maybe the terms of this inquiry would have been better if they'd been set differently. Because I would have thought that's exactly where we should be going. But the inquiry is not going to go there. Forget that one. Let's watch another clip now on disease X. They, each of them, believe health systems should prioritize for an effective response to a potential crisis. And of course, it's our honor always to have Dr. Tedros uh, with us, the Director General of the World Health Organization. And Dr. Tedros, may I ask you to answer that very simple question to start with? Thank you. Can, can you rephrase maybe the question? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> the, at, at the highest level, um, what do you think health systems should prioritize for an effective response to a potential crisis? Yeah. I think that's a, a big question, but I would like to start with um, especially the disease X. It's um, attracting a lot of attention, and I hope you have seen in the social media. Um, but it's not a new idea. Um, the first time we used the terminology was in 2018. Um, the discussions were in 2017. I was just new director general. Uh, as you know, we annually list the emerging diseases. Uh, and uh, MERS could be one, Zika, <coughs> Ebola, those we know. But then we said, there are things that are unknown that may happen. And anything happening is a matter of when, not if. So we need to have a placeholder for that, for the disease we don't know. That may come. And that was when we gave the name disease X. Um, so disease X is a placeholder for uh, unknown um, disease. Um, I just wanted to start by clarifying that because there is already a lot, a lot of attention. If I may, although 
COVID came immediately, uh, we were preparing for COVID-like uh, disease. You, you may even call COVID as the first disease X. And it may happen again. Mm, of course, there are some people who say, oh, this may create panic. No. It's better actually to anticipate something that may happen because it has <coughs> happened in our history many times and prepare for it. Interesting. The World Health Organization have been using the term disease X since 2018 for new diseases for unknowns. And uh, the director general saying it's a matter of when, not if. He didn't say when, but it's a matter of when, not if. And he said they had been preparing for disease X. And if you like, COVID was the first disease X, but they've been preparing for that. I'm not sure you could really tell they'd been preparing for that, but uh, that's what he's saying. So we have these new diseases, they are unknowns, but they need to be prepared for them. The better prepared they are, the better they're able to combat them. Possibly the more power the World Health Organization has, it might claim it's better prepared if it has more executive powers over uh, different peoples in the world. That may be part of his thinking there. We, we don't know. Um, but it's a matter of when, not if. And when this disease comes, it's either going to be a natural spillover event from nature. It's going to be an accidental leak from a laboratory. It could be from abuse of animals in our monoculture system or from um, wet markets and things in China. Um, all of these things should be addressed. But of course, What's a bit harder to address is a deliberate leak in terms of biological warfare for nefarious purposes. That could result in a lot of people suffering and, uh, and dying. That is a possibility. But I think we would reduce the likelihood of any of these outcomes by dramatically treating animals way better than we are doing and by stopping this dangerous research into protonaceous infectious particles, viruses, bacteria, um, parasites, and, and indeed fungal disease. Research needs to be done, but purely for the benefit of medical science and medical understanding, not for the preparation of commercial vested interests or biological uh, warfare agents. A few things to think about. We'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.